right, so let's get started. Lecture 30, we're going to talk about autoimmune hemolytic anemias. And if you think back, we've actually talked about these and the findings associated with um, hemolytic anemia and hematology last semester. Um, so we will revisit that during this lecture as well. So autoimmune hemolytic anemia occurs when the patient either has a um, antibody or complement that attaches to its own cells. Um, and then that will result in either intravascular hemolysis as such um, in the event of complement or extravascular hemolysis in the event of an antibody attached to the red cells. And then the spleen would take out those, um, and those cells which are antibody coated, all right? So we have some hemolysis and then that causes the basis of the patient's anemia, okay? And if you guys remember, when we were talking about autoimmune hemolytic anemia, the key word there is hemolytic anemia. So the anemia that is present will be normochromic normocytic, okay? Um, and with that autoimmune hemolytic anemia, the one way blood bank can always detect hemolytic anemias is with the DAT. So when you're interpreting your patient results, if you have a positive DAT, that indicates that your patient red cells are coated with something, whether that be an antibody or a uh, complement. So there are some known causes for a positive DAT which warrants further investigation. So some causes for that positive DAT, um, we've talked about in a previous lecture, hemolytic disease of the newborn. So this would be the DAT performed on uh, either cord blood or peripheral blood from a fetus um, that would have a positive DAT. And remember, there's two types of hemolytic disease of the newborn could be due to ABO incompatibility where mom is O and baby is either A or B. Um, it might also be due to another IgG antibody such as D, Kel, or little C, or any other IgG antibody that is capable of crossing the placenta. That is when we will see hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, now this presentation says delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. Um, remember the number one suspect IgG antibody that is um, capable of causing a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction is our kid family, JKA and JKB. However, um, a positive DAT is not only limited to the delayed hemolytic transfusion, prop, um, a better way to word this would be any type of hemolytic transfusion reaction. So you can expect that if you gave a patient the wrong ABO, that DAT is going to be positive as well because you have um, activated those ABO antibodies, complement is going to be attached to the red cell uh, membrane. So that would also cause a positive DAT. Um, and then what this lecture focuses on, we're going to talk about the autoimmune hemolytic anemias. And if you guys remember from hematology, autoimmune hemolytic anemias can be due to a cold reacting antibody, could be due to a warm reacting antibody, or it could be drug induced, all right? So there are some drugs that we're gonna talk about um, that can cause a positive DAT as well. Um, and then what, how that affects our blood bank testing. Um, autoantibodies, um, really think about what's happening with an autoantibody. You have a patient antibody that is attaching to its own red cells, hence the name autoantibody. Um, and what happens here, like I kind of mentioned earlier, those red cells are um, going to be taken out. So they have decreased survival, whether that be through intravascular hemolysis or um, taken out by the RES system, by the spleen. Also, that those antibody-coated cells will interfere with our blood bank testing. And so that's what we're going to concentrate on in this lecture. Um, so there are some studies, and we'll talk a little bit about this too, um, specifically with the drug-induced. So the drug-induced autoimmune hemolytic anemia, there are studies that indicate those drugs cause the loss of the suppressor T cell functions, which enable the B cells to continuously um, produce those antibodies. And so there's so much autoantibody being produced that it attacks the patient's own cells. Um, and so that's kind of the basis behind these autoantibodies. Um, and so like I mentioned with the suppressor T cells, it is common for individuals to build autoantibodies, but usually they're destroyed by the immune system. 
Um, so if you lose that T cell suppressor function, then the body's going to overproduce those antibodies. Um, and that's when the problem occurs. Um, and so how blood bank can detect that is through the DAT test. So if you have a positive DAT, it usually indicates your patient cells are coated with something, all right? We know that. And if you guys remember back to when we were talking about the DAT test, on an adult, we always start the DAT using polyspecific AHG. Remember, it's polyspecific because it has both anti-IgG and anti-complement, anti-C3B, C3D in it, okay? So whether your patient cells are being coated with a IgG antibody or complement polyspecific AHG will have a positive reaction. If your polyspecific is positive, then you take that step further and you test with monospecific IgG and monospecific C3B, C3D. Um, and that will tell you exactly what is coding patient cells. Now, it is possible that healthy people can have a positive DAT and have no clinical symptoms, okay? Um, and then it's some statistics here, about one in 1,000 donors may have a positive DAT, and we have talked about this before. You guys have seen this when you are doing your patient testing um, and your patient IAT is negative, but when you go to do your cross match, your cross match is incompatible. One reason for that is a positive DAT in your donor. Um, so it is possible that a healthy person has a positive DAT, um, especially if it's drug-induced, because sometimes drug-induced um, po positive DAT does not cause anemia um, for the, the donor, and so they will have no clinical symptoms associated with that positive DAT, okay? Um, so just because you have a positive DAT, that's why blood bank has to investigate because is it clinically significant or not, all right? Um, and so just like I mentioned, some patients might have the DAT, a positive DAT and not have any clinical symptoms. There have been cases in which a patient has autoimmune hemolytic anemia and the DAT is actually negative. Um, now why that would be, maybe it's the timing of uh, the sample collection, uh, maybe there's something else going on inside that patient that would um, be causing that hemolytic anemia. Um, and then, like I mentioned, sometimes there might be um, a positive DAT, but the lifespan of the cell is not affected. Um, it could be where the patient has a positive DAT and the spleen is capable of pitting those cells. Um, um, removing the antibody rather than the, taking out the whole cell. Um, so that's another option as well. So as you guys probably already know, autoantibodies are a major pain for blood bank. They do interfere with all of our testing, including um, it could interfere with your ABO, such as in the event that you have an auto anti-I, which is a room temp reacting antibody and can cause um, discrepancies in your reverse typing. So they can interfere with your ABO. They can interfere with your RH. Um, remember, if you are doing weak D testing, um, you can, and your patient has a positive DAT, that will cause your weak D RH control to be positive, all right? So it can interfere with our RH. Of course, it will interfere with our IAT testing because the antibody could be present on the cell as well as present in the patient plasma. So when we do our IAT, Autoantibodies are pan-reactive, meaning that they react with everything. So your IAT is going to be positive. Um, you're going to follow up with a positive IAT by performing a panel. Your panel is going to be positive. Um, your auto control is going to be positive. Then you're going to have to do an eluit. Um, most of the times, if it's a true autoantibody, your eluit will also be pan-reactive. Um, and then depending on, there are some instances of drug-induced um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia and then versus uh, a drug causing a positive DAT where then your eluit might be negative. And so we'll talk about the differences in that um, at the end of this lecture. Um, and then if your patient has a autoantibody, your cross matches will be incompatible as well. So you can imagine the problem there for blood bank. 
Are we obtaining a appropriate ABO, RH, on this patient? Are we able to identify any underlying antibodies? So keep in mind, we are able to rule out antibodies with negative reactions. So if everything is positive, we cannot identify any underlying antibodies. We cannot tell if those units are truly uh, incompatible or compatible. That is the problem with these autoantibodies in blood bank. We have a hard time identifying the underlying alloantibodies. Um, and so this is why it's very important. Um, clinical history and um, other information about your patient is so important. Have they been previously transfused? Have they been pregnant before? Um, if they've never received a transfusion before, and for females that have never had pregnancy, their likelihood of having an underlying um, antibody is very low. Um, if they have a primary diagnosis, um, such as lupus, mono, pneumonia, um, some type of leukemias can cause um, autoantibodies to develop as well. So the primary diagnosis of your patient can also clue you in onto what type of autoantibody might be present. Um, and then drugs. Is that positive DAT due to the drugs they're on, such as um, aldamant or um, um, chloroquinin that we're going to talk about, which is in the news right now. If you guys have been paying attention, they're using it as treatment of the COVID, so we're going to talk about the side effects of that drug. All right, so types of autoantibodies, warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia is what blood bank will most encounter among the, raw, the warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Um, and it's going to account for about 50 to 70 percent of all autoimmune hemolytic anemias. We also have some cold, agglu cold agglutinin um, antibodies that might be present to fewer cases, 16 to 32 percent. Keep in mind, though, those cold agglutinins um, Think about them as being cold, they really serve as more of a um, hindrance in blood banks. So while they might interfere with your ABO RH, or really your ABO, not necessarily your RH, uh, the back type of your ABO RH, right? So if they're a room temp reacting antibody, they could cause a discrepancy in your back type, all right? That's what the cold agglutinin um, syndrome is. And so that would be an example of that would be anti I, um, anti P your Lewis A and Lewis B, all of those antibodies that can react at room temperature, they could cause um, ABO discrepancies. Um, drug reactions can cause a positive DAT in about 12 to 18 percent. Then there's a um, specific type of cold agglutinin that we will talk about. It's paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, known as PCH. Uh, very rare. Typically, you will see it in less than 2 percent, um, and usually it occurs following an infection, such as um, chicken pox, smallpox, um, and other, let's see, uh, sometimes the respiratory infections as well, all right? So we're going to talk about PCH a little bit later in the lecture. All right, so clinical findings of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and we've talked about this from hematology. The patients will have anemia again because the spleen is taking out those cells, okay? So the patient's going to have anemia mild jaundice due to the increased cell lysis, um, enlarged spleen, all right, due to the uh, sequestering of those cells in the spleen, um, and then Raynard's phenomenon could be um, observed too, and that is just where your, um, during the blood circulation, as blood travels to the extremities away from your core, the blood cools, um, and when that blood cools, colder antibodies are able to attach to those red cells. Oh, and then here's some common findings of anemia. You guys remember, this is a hemolytic anemia, so we will have increased retic. We will see increased polychromasia on the cells. Um, and due to the increased cell lysis, we will have decreased haptoglobin um, and a positive DAT. Um, some other testing for intravascular hemolysis if a complement was involved, and so it's causing immediate cell lysis, decreased haptoglobin, you would even have increased free hemoglobin, um, and as well as hemoglobinuria. And like I mentioned, we want to use polyspecific and monospecific. We want to find out exactly what is coding those patient cells. 
oftentimes what the treatment for autoimmune hemolytic anemia, um, the first thing clinicians are wanna, gonna do is they're gonna wanna transfuse these patients. What's the problem with transfusing these patients? When a patient has a warm autoantibody, um, pan reactivity, everything is gonna be positive. It's very difficult to identify any underlying antibodies. It's very difficult to find compatible units of blood for these patients. It is blood bank's recommendation to not transfuse these patients with warm auto um, hemolytic anemia. Um, and just for that reason, because while we can try to absorb out that warm auto, which we'll talk about the process of absorption coming up, um, oftentimes it is impossible to get rid of that auto antibody, okay? Um, so we, as blood bankers, we cannot guarantee that we can provide safe and compatible units of blood for transfusion for these patients that have a warm auto. Now there are mechanisms in place. Um, a lot of times we can establish a baseline phenotype on these patients. And so when they get these warm auto antibodies, we can try to give what we call phenotypically matched least incompatible units. So we try to match their antigenic profile. Let's say if they're big E negative, Cal negative, Duffy A negative, we try to find a donor unit that is big E negative, Cal negative, Duffy A negative to prevent exposing that patient to antigen positive red cells, which could increase their hemolytic anemia, right? We could worsen the situation by transfusing them. That's the concern with transfusion, transfusing these patients that have autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Um, so if your patient does have a cold agglutinin, um, one thing that we've talked about before, blood bank can recommend the use of a blood warmer. Um, and so as the blood is being transfused, it's being warmed up to 37 degrees. Um, and so that's one way we can get around a cold agglutinin. However, there is no way to get around a warm auto, okay? Um, and so we've talked about this before, differentiating a warm autoantibody from a cold autoantibody is simply the reaction at which the antibody is reacting, all right? So if your antibody is reacting at room temp, and then dissipates at 37 degrees, that would be a cold reacting antibody. If the antibody is negative at initial spin, but then pops out at 37 and AHG, that would be a warm reacting antibody. So that is how blood bank differentiates between a cold reacting antibody and a warm reacting antibody. I mean, so here's some further differentiation. Notice that a warm, um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, warm antibody, um, reacting temperature would be greater than 32 degrees Celsius, okay? So at the, it reacts in, inside the patient's body at 37 degrees Celsius, all right? Um, typically with those warm autoantibodies, they are of IgG classification. Some have the capability to activate complement, very rarely though, usually it's just an IgG antibody, um, and this is extravascular hemolysis, all right? So the antibody is attached to the red cells, um, and that cell destruction is occurring inside the spleen. This is what we will most commonly see if there is a hemolytic anemia present, it's probably due to a warm reacting antibody. Um, cold temperature, uh, cold Antibodies, temperature is greater than 30 degrees. So usually you have about 30 to 32 degrees. Um, and so usually you think about those cold reacting antibodies um, as the blood is circulating away from the core. So in your toes, in your fingers, that's when the antibody attaches to the red cells if it's a cold reacting antibody. Um, typically those are IgM classification, those are the ones that will interfere with our ABO testing. Those are the ones that react at initial spin. They are IgM, all right? So remember a characteristic of our IgM is that it is capable of initiating complements. So that's the problem with cold reacting antibodies. They can initiate complement, um, therefore causing intravascular hemolysis. And the frequency, again, not as common as our warm autos, 16 to 32%. All right, so your cold autoantibodies, 
Um, usually positive for C3D. Also, uh, and you guys have to think about your complement cascade here. You guys remember C3 convertase is going to um, convert uh, the C3 molecule into C3A and C3B. C3A is going to be involved in some um, inflammation responses. C3B is what is going to attach to the cell membrane. All right, so that is why when we do our monospecific um, AHG testing, the reagent has anti-C3B and C3D. C3D is a further breakdown product of C3B, all right? So you can detect C3B and C3D on the cell membrane. That is how blood bank identifies the presence of complement, right? I wanted to make that clarification. Um, cold autoantibodies usually are pathologic, meaning that they occur following an infection, such as mycoplasma pneumoniae or infectious mononucleosis. And again, their um, desired temperature is at 30 to 32 degrees. And again, that's usually occurring because your core, um, as you, if you think about your body circulation, um, your core is at 37 degrees. So as the, the cells travel away from your core, further into your extremities, your fingers and your toes, your temperature decreases. Um, and so usually in the temperature at your fingers and toes is, is anywhere from 30 to 32 degrees, okay? And um, so that's when these cold reacting antibodies are allowed to um, bind. Um, Cold autoantibodies can also be idiopathic, causing cold agglutinin syndrome, um, and that could be seen in 16 to 32% of our um, acquired hemolytic anemias. So again, these cold autoantibodies um, are typically more of a nuisance for blood bank. They're really harmless for the patient. Maybe some um, cell lysis going on, But it's those pathological codes that usually cause the intravascular hemolysis, all right? So you have to think about what's going on, especially if you have uh, a patient with the cold agglutinin disease where they, they, they're always cold. I don't know if any of you guys um, know somebody like that, but they always um, complain of their fingers and toes being cold. That could be indicative of the cold agglutinin disorder. So you can imagine those cold autoantibodies, they do cause problems for blood bank. They can interfere with our ABO. Um, however, a way to resolve these cold um, antibodies is that we could warm our sample, warm our reagents at 37 degrees. This is what we call pre-warm. Um, if a cold agglutinin is present, then the antibody antigen complex will dissipate at 37 degrees. Um, there's also some thiol reagents that you could add. Um, an example of that is DTT. And what DTT will do is it will um, remove that IgM antibody from the red cells. So if you do have agglutination occurring, then you could do a DTT treatment and it would remove that antibody from the cells um, so we could obtain a true um, red cell um, typing. All right, so some cold autoantibodies that we've talked about before, anti-big I, anti-little I, um, anti-IH, which is a compound antibody. Remember, for anti-IH to react, both the I antigen and the H antigen must be present. Um, and then you also have anti-H. These guys are known to interfere with your reverse typing and your IAT at initial spin. Now, I would like to say all of these antibodies react at room temp. So if you think about the testing methodology that's used, if you are using gel methodology, you will not pick up these cold reacting antibodies, okay? Um, so that's another advantage to using gel technology um, because you only have AHG phase of testing. 
So we will completely bypass these initial span reacting, room temp reacting, cold antibodies. Um, you have to be really careful though, if you do detect these initial span antibodies, you, we want to make sure that we don't miss identifying other allo clinically significant antibodies. Um, and so that's why when we do our AHG phase of testing, if you are doing the tube method, want to make sure you are using anti-monospecific IgG, okay? If you are using polyspecific AHG and these cold reacting antibodies are of the a, um, uh, IgM classification, they are capable of activating complement. If we are using polyspecific, which contains anti-complement, we could have positive reactions with that polyspecific, all right? And that could cause um, positive reactions. And then again, the concern would be missing underlying allo antibodies that are more clinically significant than these cold reacting antibodies. So that's why when you do your IAT for AHG phase of testing, we always want to use monospecific. And again, for these uh, patients with the cold reacting antibody, blood bank will recommend the use of a blood warmer during transfusion. All right, so if you guys remember, we've talked about this before, the difference between anti-H, anti-I, and anti-IH. If you take a look at anti-I and anti-IH, so the second and third columns here, ignoring the Bombay reactions right now, all right? So if you take a look at those, they are exactly the same, all right, um, given that anti-I has a little bit stronger reactions with um, your A1 cells and your, um, your, 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 let me start over. Um, okay, so don't look at Bombay, all right? So mask your Bombay right now. Look at anti-I and anti-IH. Those reactions with your A1 cells, your A2 cells, and your O cells and your auto control um, are all positive. Right? Negative, of course, with your cord because we're not dealing with little i. The only way to differentiate anti-I from anti-IH is to run Bombay cells. And remember what Bombay cells, they contain no H substance, okay? So remember the anti-IH is a compound antibody the I antigen and the H antigen must be present. So while your adult Bombay cells have the I antigen, that's why we have a two plus reaction with the anti-I, those cells lack the H substance. That's why we have a negative reaction with the Bombay cells. That is the only way you can differentiate anti-I from anti-IH, okay? Um, and notice the reaction with the cord cells kind of differentiates anti-H because those O cord cells have plenty of H substance. And so that's why we have a positive reaction um, with the cord cells for anti-H. Um, you guys, when you are interpreting these cold reacting antibodies, you have to think about the cells you are running patient plasma with, all right? So that's how all of these little mini cold panels, this is what this is. This would be a mini cold panel. Um, this is when you're mixing patient plasma with reagent cells, all right? So remember when you're trying to differentiate H um, from I from anti-IH, think about what's going on there. Your A1 has the least amount of H substance present, all right? Your A2 is gonna have a little bit more than, uh, H substance than A1. Your O cells have the greatest amount of H substance. That is why we have a four plus reaction with anti-H. That is why there's a stronger reaction with the anti-IH as well, all right? Because you have to know which blood type um, and the amount of H substance associated with that blood type. So a good rule of thumb, always remember A1 and A1B are going to have the least amount of H substance. 
okay? Because A1 is very antigenic and will mask all of the H substance. And then A1B, of course, has the A1 antigen and the B antigen reacting on that uh, l fucose oligosaccharide chain, okay? Um, so I hope that helps break down anti-H, anti-I, and anti-IH. If you guys have any questions on that, um, I feel like that's a really good board question. Um, so if you guys have any questions about that, please let me know. Okay. Um, Cherica? Yes. I, would it be okay to um, either email you or arrange a call later? Um, because part of this is has to actually do with my project <laughs> and just to try to talk through some things to make sure that I'm understanding it for the warm because I I'm in the group that has the warm auto yay yeah. So <laughs> yeah we can definitely do a teleconference later if you guys have any questions okay all right thank you um if not today I do have some applicant interviews um, this afternoon if not today definitely tomorrow okay thank you All right, so one thing you guys have to understand about the blood bank workup with autoantibodies, um, what's going to happen is if your IAT is positive, you'll do a panel. If your panel is positive and you do your auto control, if that auto control is positive, you're going to do a DAT. If that DAT is positive, guess what? You're going to have to do an eluate, all right? If your DAT is positive due to complement from these IgM antibodies and you do that eluate, C3B, C3D is not a IgG reacting antibody. We will not detect complement in our eluate, all right? So oftentimes, if you have a positive DAT, you will do an eluate. If complement is involved, your eluate is going to be negative, all right? Um, and this says eluates are not commonly performed. I think that would be basis on your facility's standard operating procedure. In, in my experience, anytime we had a positive DAT, whether it was positive with C3B, C3D, or IgG, we had to do an eluate, all right? Um, anytime that DAT was positive, we had to do an eluate. So pay attention to that. Um, even though if your DAT indicates that it's complement, that eluate is gonna be non-reactive, but your facility might require an eluate just to prove that only complement is coding those cells. All right, so make sure you pay attention to that. Um, if your patient has severe cold gluten disease, it's very important. Um, the cold gluten disease can interfere with hematology testing, if you guys remember. Um, what that cold gluten is going to do, your red cell count is going to go down, your MCV is going to be increased. Um, so that will interfere with hematology testing as well as our blood bank testing if it's a severe cold gluten. Um, so one thing that can do you can do during the phlebotomy process is as soon as that sample is drawn, you could um, keep it warm. Sometimes um, facilities might have like a, um, uh, some people use like warm sand. And so once that um, uh, tube is collected, they immediately put it in the warm sand to keep it at 37 degrees to keep that cold agglutinin from forming. Um, that's one way they can do it. Um, so keep warm after drawing um, the DAC re uh, results. The red cells are gonna be coated with complement. That's what we're doing um, and that's why I would say probably 100% across the boards, most facilities use EDTA sample um, just to prevent calcium from being involved in the complement cascade from being initiated um, in vitro. So think about the difference between serum and plasma. With serum, you don't have any coagulation, uh, anticoagulant, all right, so that clot is able to form, calcium is present, so that um, the um, complement cascade is allowed to continue versus EDTA will chelate that calcium, right? So then calcium is not available for that complement cascade to continue. All right, so there's a specific cold agglutinin 
um, that I want to talk about. It's paroxysmal cold hemoglobin urea. All right. Do not confuse this with paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea that we talked about in hematology. Both involve cell lysis. One is temperature dependent, one is not. All right. So remember from hematology, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea is when the cells lack CD55 and CD59, making them susceptible to lysis by complement. All right. Paroxysmal cold hemoglobin urea is a specific type of cold autoantibody, usually seen um, following an infection. It is often termed the Donat Landsteiner antibody. Okay. Um, we have thus far mentioned cold reacting antibodies being IgM. This one that causes paroxysmal cold hemoglobin urea is IgG. Okay, and again, very rare, um, but it is associated, it's an IgG antibody capable of causing um, hem hemolysis. Okay, and it's termed um, biphasic hem hem hemolysin. All right, and the reason it's for that is because as the cells at 37 degrees is fine, but as the blood circulates away from the core into the extremities, it gets colder, all right? Um, that is when the antibody is able to attach to the red cells, and then as the blood circulates back to the core, it warms up. That is what causes the cell hemolysis. Okay, so you have complement attaching to the cells, and then when it warms up, you have hemolysis occurring. That's why it's called the biphasic um, hemolysin. Okay? The paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria is associated with anti-P. Right? So this is kind of the exception to the rule. Anti-P is a room temp reacting antibody, but it is of IgG classification. All right, so if you have your antibody chart um, from your lecture manual, I would write that out to the side that anti-P um, is your donath landsteiner antibody. It is of IgG classification. So one way that we can identify this anti-P is we would do the donath landsteiner test. Um, and so what you do, you take patient plasma mixed with cells that are P positive, so you suspect your patient has anti-P, you're going to mix it with the P antigen. And what's gonna happen is, remember this is a biphasic antibody, all right? So it has to go from cold to warm in order for hemolysis to occur. So you're gonna have three separate tubes. You're gonna have one tube that you warm up at 37 degrees, you're going to have one tube that you incubate at a refrigerated temperature, four degrees, and then you're going to have one tube that you incubate at four degrees and then immediately warm up to 37 degrees. Because this is a biphasic antibody, notice that you do not have hemolysis unless you have the attachment of the complement at four degrees and then the warming up to 37 degrees. All right, it has to have the very variable temperature in order for hemolysis to occur. All right. For the third bullet there, is that because the image is kind of covering it? Oh, does that oh, just okay. say complement activation as the blood is warming? Let's see. Yeah. Take a break. Warm to 37. Oh, okay. There we go. Sorry about Got that. It. No, no, that's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think there is one case study that a group is working on that involves this. Um, so if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to schedule a teleconference about this as well. Um, I know that's confusing because it's a cold reacting antibody, but it's a IgG classification, but it is a biphasic. It has to be exposed to the colder temperature and then warm back up in order for the hemolysis to occur. Um, that's the issue with this anti-P. All right, and then here is your uh, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea. Don't confuse the two, all right? Um, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea is not an autoantibody, does not cause any problems for blood bank testing, all right? Um, you will have the cells lysed um, due to complement of this as well.
All right, so um, this chart really differentiates the difference in using polyspecific AHG versus monospecific IgG AHG. So this is in your IAT testing. Notice um, your screening cell one is a two plus reaction at initial span. Um, your screening cell two is negative. Your auto control is negative, all right? Um, and then we have incompatible. This would be your um, compatibility testing. So unit number 613, unit number 502. Those last two rows are your cross matches. Notice that we have a room temp antibody reacting at initial spin, okay? Um, and it's also interfering with our cross matches. Notice that cold reacting antibody goes away at 37 degrees, but because we're using polyspecific in the AHG, it causes positive reactions, all right? So this is probably due to an antibody that is present on screening cell one um, that is causing this positive reaction at initial spin and polyspecific AHG. Notice with the IgG AHG, we have a negative reaction. Um, that's because it's probably a um, complement that's causing these positive reactions and we would not detect that using monospecific IgG, AHG, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so this is a, this is a cold aloe antibody because our auto control is negative right there, all right? So a cold aloe antibody, so the patient has an antibody that's cold reacting reacting with screening cell one. So the antibody, the antigen is present on screening cell one and our two units, but not on screening cell two, okay? So if you do have a cold aloe antibody, um, these guys, like I mentioned before, are usually clinically insignificant. Um, if you're only doing the AHG phase of testing in your IAT, then um, blood bank wouldn't even detect it. Um, and so some examples of that would be anti-P1, all right? Anti-P1 is different from anti-P, all right? So don't, don't confuse those two. Anti-P1, anti-M and N, Lewis A and Lewis B. So those are some of the antibodies that we've talked about before that are capable of reacting at room temperature. Um, and as you guys know, we could, um, if you do have initial spin reactions, we could get rid of these by neutralization. Um, enzyme treatment, and then also you could pre-warm these guys, all right, and by warming your plasma, warming your reagent cells, and then um, incubating them together, that would dis dissipate the antibody, and therefore your reactions would become negative. All right, so let's talk about our warm autoantibodies. Um, warm autoantibodies are due to IgG, antibody that are coating your patient cells. Now, um, this could be idiopathic, meaning that the reason for these warm autos is unknown. Uh, oftentimes, you'll see these occur secondary to an infection, such as lymphoma, lupus, or uh, CLL. The DAT is going to be positive with your polyspecific AHG. The coating may be due to IgG and or complement. It is very common with warm autoantibodies that your DAT is positive both with polyspecific AHG, um, monospecific IgG, and monospecific C3B, C3B. Um, and then also keep in mind if you were to do um, your RH testing and you are using a high protein anti-D, your RH control might also be positive. But most places don't use that high protein anymore just because of the um, increased false positives. Um, this says you can add chloroquine diphosphate. That is a um, way to remove the antibody that's coating patient cells. It's a type of elution, which we'll talk about in the next lecture that keeps the cells viable. So rather than some of the Louis freeze elutions that we've talked about and the acid elutions that we talked about to dissociate the antibody from the cells, that both of those involve cell lysis, okay? Chloroquine diphosphate 
dissociates the antibody from the red cells, keeping the cells viable. So then we can test the red cells. All right. So you could um, get rid of the whatever's causing the positive DAT. A chloroquine diphosphate treatment would cause that DAT to go negative. All right, and then you could um, get a true antigen phenotype on those cells. All right, so your warm autoantibodies, they are reacting at 37 and AHG that will cause a positive IAT. Um, you must determine if it's an autoantibody, if there is any underlying alloantibodies. So that is the problem with these warm autoantibodies, okay? Um, so we can try to remove the autoantibody out of the patient's plasma. Um, so I want you guys to understand what's going on in these autoantibodies. The first thing that's gonna happen is these B cells are creating all of these autoantibodies. It is going to attach to the cells. Um, once all of the binding sites on these cells are taken up, then you will also have it present in the patient plasma as well. So you'll have some unbound autoantibody present in the patient plasma. So you have the autoantibody attached to the cells as well as in the plasma. So how does that affect blood bank testing? Um, your DAT is going to be positive. When you elute off that antibody, your eluate is going to be positive. Okay, so that's what was coating your patient cells. And then also, your uh, IAT and your panel is going to be positive because that autoantibody is also present in the plasma. So it's not only coding cells, it's also circulating in the patient plasma. All right, I want you guys to understand that. Um, we've talked before, that brings up a good point, we've talked um, before about transfusion reactions, especially the delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. When your patient first starts exhibiting, um, exhibiting symptoms of a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, their DAT is going to be positive. Depending on the titer, let's say it's a JKA, depending on the titer of that JKA, it might only be attached to the red cells. Um, so your IAT and your panel might be negative, but your auto control is going to be positive. And then when you do your DAT, it is going to be positive. And then when you do your LUIT, um, it will be positive and it will have a pattern of reactivity that matches JKA. So what's happening is the patient's antibody is coating those donor cells. And then when we perform our LUIT, we have eluded off that antibody off the cells. Okay, so that's one example of where it's present on the cells, but timing wise, it is not in the plasma yet. Okay, so that's an example of where it can coat patient cells, but not be in the plasma yet, all right? A warm autoantibody, usually the titer is very high, it's coating the cells, and it's present in the um, plasma as well. That's the problem, um, because it's in the plasma, we cannot identify any underlying alloantibodies. Um, we will try, there are some methods in place that we can try to remove that autoantibody out of the plasma so we can identify any underlying antibodies. And so that's just what this says, um, the warm autoantibody will eventually be in the serum. So it's um, attaching to the red cells first, and then all of the unbound autoantibody will still be present in the patient plasma. So, um, a good rule of thumb when you're identifying these warm autoantibodies, typically your reaction strengths are going to be all the same, all right? So if you have a one plus or two plus, that will be across the board. Your IAT is going to be all two plus. Your panels reactions are all going to be two plus, all right? So you have the same strength across the boards in all of your plasma testing. All right, so we have some methods in place where we can try to remove this warm auto. Um, and I might have mentioned this before, it's called auto adsorption. So what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to adsorb out that warm auto so we can identify any underlying um, allo antibodies. However, if the patient has been transfused within the past three months, a adsorption um, and autoabsorption cannot be performed. And the reason for that is, 
Think about within the last three months, if they have been transfused, they have donor cells in their circulation. Those donor cells, if you try to do an autoabsorption, could absorb out the alloantibody, all right? So we could get a false interpretation for identifying any underlying alloantibodies. So um, always, always remember, if your patient has been transfused in the last three months, you cannot do an autoabsorption. You have to do what we call a differential um, absorption, and we're going to talk about that. Um, there's also a treatment, it's called ZZAP, so it um, combines um, DTT and Fison or another enzyme such as the papain, all right? So you have DTT and enzyme um, being used to treat the cells. And so remember, what that is going to do is it is going to um, remove some of the sialic acid from the cells. Um, and inhibit reactions um, and try to dissociate the antibody, okay? So what's happening, and we're gonna talk about that, uh, and then here's ZZAP, it's used to treat the cells, um, and you can, per you can purchase this, it's a manufactured commercial kit, it's called WARM. So what you're gonna do is you're going to incubate patient cells that are coated with the autoantibody. And I like this diagram because you have your autoantibody here indicated by the black um, that is a, attached to patient cells. In the event you have some underlying alloantibodies, you have um, indicated here by the green, notice that the warm ant autoantibody takes up all the binding sites. The alloantibody is unable to bind, all right? So that means that we're unable to detect it because that warm autoantibody is uh, more prominent, all right? So what we wanna try to do is we want to try to remove that autoantibody. So we can take those red cells um, and we will, or take the patient sample, treat it with DTT, all right, or ZZAP to remove that autoantibody from the cells and then we are left with the cells that are now without the autoantibody attached. So this is what we call treated patient cells, all right? They have been treated with DTT. Now we will incubate it with your patient plasma where your alloantibody is, okay? So now that autoantibody is removed and then we can identify the underlying allo antibody. Does that, make, does that make sense to everybody? So what's happening is once that auto antibody is removed from the cell, I think I forgot to mention this step. So here in the second tube, you have your patient red cells. Remember, so the auto antibody attaches to the red cells, also in the plasma. Once we remove that autoantibody from the red cells, then we will incubate those treated patient cells with the plasma. The antibody, the autoantibody that's present in the plasma will be what we call adsorbed onto those cells, all right? So now you have your autoantibody that's attaching to those cells. Um, and then we have what we call adsorbed plasma. Adsorbed plasma, then we can run with our panel cells and identify the underlying alloantibody. Um, so this is the basis behind an absorption process. Um, now keep in mind, we, you can do this three to four times to try to absorb out all of that warm autoantibody. Sometimes it does not always yield um, autoantibody free plasma for identification. Um, so after you perform this adsorption and then you rerun your adsorbed plasma against your panel cells, you could still have pan reactivity. So that's the problem with warm autoantibodies. We are unable to identify any underlying alloantibodies. And so like here in this um, slide says maybe necessary to perform 
several times. Um, so you can imagine a warm autoantibody patient is very time consuming. It's a real pain for blood bankers um, because they're having to do every single blood bank test that we have. We're doing um, ABO discrepancy resolving. We're doing an IAT. We're doing a panel with a positive auto control. We're doing a DAT. We're doing an LUIT. Um, which is all positive, and then we're going to do a autoabsorption if possible, and that absorption might have to be performed three to four times um, in order to adequately absorb out all of that autoantibody. Um, and then you still might not get a negative um, reaction in the plasma. Um, and so this just kind of further breaks it down. Really what's going on in a auto absorption. So you're taking your patient cells, all right, that's where the auto antibody is attached to the patient cells. We're going to treat it with DTT, which will dissociate the antibody, all right. So then we have the red cells with available antigen binding sites, okay. Then we add it back to, we take a aliquot of those treated cells mix it with an aliquot of patient plasma with available, those red cells have available binding sites. So now the plasma with the warm auto is adsorbed on to the red cell membrane, right? So you're absorbing the warm auto out of the plasma, okay? The goal here is to obtain autoantibody-free plasma, right? Which is termed adsorbed plasma. Um, and then you repeat your panel. Hopefully that warm auto is now out of the plasma and we can identify any underlying aloe antibodies, all right? All right, so remember we said that if a patient has been transfused within the last three months, we cannot do a auto absorption. If the patient has been transfused within the last three months, we can do what we call a differential or allogenic absorption. And so what that entails is instead of using the patient's own cells, we use a selected um, three different cells that have a selected phenotypic pattern. And the reason we choose these cells indicated here in this box, um, because usually warm autos take on a specific uh, specificity. Um, usually the most common specificity is of RH. Okay, so usually sometimes your warm autoantibody, um, little e, is the most common specificity. So we would um, run these known phenotypes to try to get your patient's autoantibody to adsorb onto these cells. So trying to get it out of the plasma, that's our end goal here, um, whether you're doing an autoabsorption versus a allogenic absorption where you're using commercial cells to try to adsorb out that um, autoantibody, okay? Um, and so you will have three different tubes, you'll have, um, you're mixing patient plasma where that autoantibody is with different cells of phenotypic uh, profile trying to get the autoantibody to attach to those cells, right? Once it attaches to those cells, then it's no longer in the plasma, right? So then we have autoantibody-free plasma that we can run against our panel um, for identification. Oh, um, one note I did want to make. I knew I forgot something. Remember ZZAP, all right? ZZAP is a combination of DTT and enzyme. Remember what DTT does. If you, if you guys remember back to our antibody identification lectures, DTT destroys the Cal antigen site, all right? So while we're doing all of these um, autoabsorption procedures, you have to keep in mind that if the patient has an allocal, we will not be able to identify it because we have destroyed the Kel antigen site, all right? So oftentimes, um, if you do the autoabsorption using DTT as a treatment, 
then um, you will not be able to identify Kel. So one of the ways blood bank gets around that is they will try to provide Kel negative units um, for transfusion, just because um, DTT is known to destroy the Kel antigen, right? All right, so this is what it looks like with the warm auto uh, antibody. This is what your, these are your panel cells. So if you were doing a um, eight cell panel, cells one, two, eight, um, this would be a warm reacting antibody. So notice our initial spin in 37 are all negative, panels one through eight and your auto control. But look at AHG, because this is a warm reacting antibody, we're only picking it up at the um, AHG phase of testing, all right? So it's a one plus. And that's how we know it's a warm reacting antibody just based off of the temperature uh, reactions, the phase of reactivity. Negative at initial spin, so it's not a cold. Positive at AHG, it's a warm, okay? Um, and like we mentioned, you cannot perform autoabsorptions if your patient has been transfused within three months. I um, mean, again, the reason for that, I want to make sure you guys understand the reason for that is because um, you will have donor cells that are in circulation. If your patient has an allo antibody, those donor cell, if, um, and you do the absorption, an autoabsorption where you're using the patient's own cells, those donor cells that are present could absorb, absorb out the um, allo antibody as well, all right? So then we wouldn't be identifying any underlying antibodies. Um, and this is what I mentioned earlier too. Sometimes your warm auto will take on a specific specificity. So I have a hard time saying that word, sorry. Um, you will see a pattern. So oftentimes, most oftentimes, it will be of one of the RH families. The most common one is little e, all right? And if you think about the presence of little e um, on 98% of the cells, so pretty much all of your panel cells are going to be reactive, all right? Um, so you will often see that. Um, and, but most commonly, what you're going to see pan reactivity, that warm auto is going to react with everything, all right? And as you guys know, blood bank relies on negative reactions for ruling out antibodies. If we don't have any negative reactions in our panel, we can't rule out anything. So we have no idea if there are any underlying antibodies. Okay, and so like I mentioned earlier too, how do we handle these patients? The clinicians are going to want to transfuse. What's blood bank going to do? Blood bank will recommend that these patients not be transfused unless absolutely necessary. And even if these patients are transfused, it is very difficult to find cross-match compatible. So when you do your cross-matches at um, all three phases, initial spin, 37, and AHG, your cross-matches at AHG are gonna be incompatible. So usually in worst case scenario, the clinicians are gonna transfuse we will give phenotypically matched least incompatible. Um, and the clinicians have to sign a waiver for this saying that they're aware these units are um, incompatible. They are taking the liability um, for that, all right? So we try to give phenotypically matched in order um, to prevent exposure of foreign antigens and identification of any underlying allo antibodies, all right? So if the patient does have an allo antibody, then it will not attack those donor cells, okay? So that's how blood bank tries to handle transfusing these patients. Our initial recommendation will be do not transfuse at all. Um, rather give um, supportive therapy like um, steroids or um, oxygen, all right? Rather than transfuse, try to do other alternate methods of treatment. Um, and so taking it back to hematology, you guys remember some of the findings that are associated with um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. There's hemoglobin is going to be low, all right? This is a normochromic, normocytic situation. They're going to have spherocytes and red cell fragments on their peripheral smear. And the reason for spherocytes is because as, the, as these cells go through the spleen, um, the macrophages might try to pit and try to remove that 
antibody from the cells causing a shape change in the protein structure of those cells causing spherocytes. Um, and then otherwise that anemia is caused by complete culling of those cells. So complete cell destruction, all right? And that's what causes the patient's anemia, that extravascular hemolysis, increased cell destruction, shortened lifespan of these red cells. Um, and so, like I mentioned, very hard to transfuse these patients to find compatible blood, oftentimes will give least incompatible. So I want you guys to understand what that means. When you do your cross matches, you're going to have a glutenation present at the phase of AHG, right? Anytime you have a positive reaction in your cross match, that indicates incompatibility, okay? So that indicates your patient's plasma is going to attack those donor cells, right? So this is a major cross match you're mixing patient plasma with donor red cells, all right? Um, sometimes these patients might even have a splenectomy to try to reduce the amount of cell destruction. Um, and so just like we mentioned, if a patient has been recently transfused, we don't want to do a autoabsorption to try to get rid of that autoantibody in the plasma, again, because those donor cells will absorb out the um, alloantibody. Um, and then when a warm autoantibody is present, it's often necessary to remove some of the autoantibody with enzymes. Um, we could treat those patient cells with DTT like we mentioned. Again, it helps to avoid more antibody from being absorbed from the plasma. All right, so let's take a look at some of our DAT testing in a cold autoantibody versus a warm autoantibody, all right? So if you're doing your DAT polyspecific in both a cold and a warm, the polyspecific is going to be positive in both. And the reason for that is polyspecific contains anti-IgG and anti-C3B, C3D, okay? So in a cold, um, even though it could be an IgM antibody that is activating complement, it's complement included in that polyspecific, so that's why we have a positive polyspecific. With the warm, it's a positive reaction with polyspecific because of the IgG association, all right? So to prove that, we would then perform monospecific testing, monospecific IgG and monospecific C3B, C3D. Notice for our cold, because it is an IgM antibody, it reacts with C3B, not IgG, okay? Um, and then for your warm, notice that we do have a positive reaction with IgG, um, and usually you're gonna have a negative reaction with C3B, C3D. However, I have seen warm autoantibodies react with both IgG and complement, all right? So that's pos possible too, okay? Um, and so remember, Anytime you have a positive DAT, we must do an eluate, okay? So if you have a cold agglutinin where complement is coating patient cells, your eluate is going to be negative, all right? Because there is not complement on our panel cells, okay? So that's why our eluate will be negative. Um, if you have a warm autoantibody due to an IgG antibody, then your eluate is going to be pan-reactive. It'll be all positive or it could be um, that specificity to the RH antibodies, okay? And then our cold agglutinins, they like to react at four degrees and our warm reacts at 37 degrees. All right, so we've talked about autoimmune uh, hemolytic anemia due to cold antibodies. We talked about autoimmune hemolytic due to warm reacting antibodies. Now let's talk about drug mediated cell destruction, okay? Um, so typically you would see this, um, this is unexpected results in our routine testing. Usually if it's a positive DAT due to drug, 
we will only be able to tell that in our blood bank testing as the um, auto control is going to be positive, all right? And that's in your AHG phase of testing. Uh, the drugs cause a positive DAT. All right, so what happens with these cells that are coated with the drug? Um, it could result in decreased cell survival. Um, and it, it really makes blood bank testing very difficult. So if we're trying to do compatibility testing, it could interfere with our compatibility testing and um, our DAT and IAT testing as well. So patient history is very important. So if you have a patient that has a positive DAT, um, oftentimes what happens, and we're gonna go through some scenarios, if your patient has a positive DAT, um, and then you do your polyspecific and monospecific testing, and then you do your eluate and it's all negative, well, that means that um, it wasn't an IgG antibody coding the drug, the, the cells, um, it was more of a drug. And keep in mind, our reagent blood bank cells are not coded with the drug, so we're unable to detect that. All right, so there's four mechanisms that are thought to be involved in this drug-induced hemolytic anemia. One is where the drug is directly absorbed onto the cell surface. Um, there's one where a drug, um, anti-drug complex is formed, all right? Um, there's one where the red cell membrane is modified, and then there's true drug-induced autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So we're gonna look at each of these. All right, so what happens in drug absorption, you have a patient that is on a drug, that drug coats the patient red cells, and then your B cells are going to produce antibodies to that drug, and then that um, anti-drug antibody is going to coat those cells. Um, usually what happens is the cell usually does not have, uh, rarely results in hemolysis. This is an IgG antibody. Um, and so it, when you do your DAT, it's gonna be positive with polyspecific, it's gonna be positive with complement and IgG, but when we do our eluate, the eluate will all be negative, all right? Um, and that's um, just because our panel cells cannot detect the anti-drug. Um, now there, there are instances where you could purchase, um, and the most common drug that does this, um, penicillin is known to cause this. Um, so the patient might develop an anti-penicillin antibody. And so there are commercially manufactured cells. You can get penicillin-coated panel cells. Um, and in that instance, the patient's anti-penicillin will react with patient cells. And that's one way blood bank can identify um, when the drug is coating the patient cells. Typically what happens um, in these drug absorptions, typically patients don't um, develop anemia. Um, it's, it's usually no clinical symptoms associated with it. Blood bank just finds it in their testing. Um, and so like I mentioned, elution is non-reactive. You can get some penicillin-coated cells to try to identify that anti-penicillin. Um, is that worth it? Most blood banks are not gonna purchase those penicillin-coated cells just because of the excess um, expense and time. So usually we will just use patient history to say, yes, this patient's on penicillin, blood bank suspects, su su suspects the DAT is positive to drugs, okay? Um, and then it's up to the clinicians if they wanna stop the use of that antibiotic or other drug that might cause it. Um, that's the, really the only way to resolve this. All right, so there's another way um, that drugs cause um, a positive DAT and that's through a um, drug anti-drug antibody, all right? So the patient is exposed to the drug. That drug is going to bind to a macro protein molecule that's in that patient's uh, plasma, such as albumin, forming a immune complex. That immune complex will attach to the patient's red cells, sensitizing those red cells, and then could result in intravascular hemolysis, also activating complement, um, and then could result in extravascular hemolysis by the spleen. 
So that's um, an drug anti-drug complex formation that attaches to the cells, right? So it's not the drug itself attaching to the cells. The drug is attaching to another protein in the patient's circulation. So in this example at the bottom where you, it has quinine, so that's what they're talking about now. Yes. All right. So um, Sarah, I'm glad you brought that up. So if you guys have been following the news on COVID-19, um, hydroxychloroquine is being used. It's an anti-malarial drug. This is a known side effect. This is why the FDA had to approve um, emergency release treatment for these COVID-19 patients. Um, and so what happens is, if, I don't know if you guys have been following COVID-19, but they have found that zinc will um, prevent the coronavirus from replicating inside the cell. However, zinc cannot cross the red cell membrane or the, or the cell membrane. So they are using um, hydroxychloroquine as a uh, membrane barrier. So it can go inside the cell Therefore, it binds to zinc, and therefore zinc gets inside the cell can prevent COVID-19 from replicating. So they can stop it from replicating. Um, and that's the treatment they're using now, as well as azithromycin to um, prevent um, bacterial, secondary bacterial pneumonia. That's what's happening um, in the COVID-19. So if you guys aren't following this, I highly recommend. Um, it's, it's very um, interesting. And so this is the side effect. So all of these COVID-19 patients that are being treated with hydroxychloroquine um, probably going to have a positive DAT. So, um, and that's a side effect. It could um, induce um, cell hemolysis. All right, so again, the problem with these drugs is we know it's coding the cell, but when we do our eluate, our eluate is all negative. All right, just because our panel cells don't have the drug on it. Um, and there's another mechanism. Um, cephalothin and other antibiotics have been known to cause this. And so what happens is cephalin, ceph ceph cephalothin um, can modify the red cell membrane. So you have ceph cephalothin. Um, with the patient red cells, and depending on the pH, whether it be alkaline or um, acidic, can allow either IgG to bind or complement to bind. Um, and therefore, that will result in um, cell lysis as well. And then that will cause your patient to have a positive DAT as well. All right, so true drug-induced autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Usually what happens, differentiating drug-induced autoimmune hemolytic anemia from autoimmune hemolytic anemia due to um, a circulating antibody, usually a true autoimmune hemolytic anemia, so non-drug association, the patient's gonna have symptoms of anemia, all right? With drug-induced, the DAT is gonna be positive, however, but usually the patient's um, clinical symptoms of anemia are much less, all right, um, maybe even non-existent. So that's one way you can differentiate, oh, my patient has a positive DAT, um, is it the drug they're on? So, and that's another reason why our Eluit testing is all negative as well, all right? Um, Aldimet is known to do this. Aldimet is a um, Um, alpha methyl dopa. If you guys, uh, methyl dopa is was a previous um, um, blood pressure medication, I believe. Yes. Um, and so methyl dopa, they used to treat that, and so they've kind of now changed the um, structure of the drug now to prevent this from happening. So what happens is it is thought that these drugs interfere with the suppressor T cell function. Um, and so the suppressor T cells prevent the formation of all of these antibodies from the B cells. And so if the suppressor T cell function is inhibited, then the body continuously produces these antibodies, these autoantibodies. Um, and so it's going to attach to the red cells. So that is true drug-induced autoimmune hemolytic anemia when the, the T cell function is inhibited. Um, and so you have those B cells producing 
IgG autoantibodies. So your DAT is going to be positive, and then your eluate is also going to be panreactive as well because of that formation of the IgG antibody. Um, it is not specific, all right? So it will not have a specific pattern of reactivity. Um, and so everything is gonna be positive. It's going to look just like a warm autoantibody. And again, that's why when we're doing warm autoantibody um, workups, we always wanna know what type of drug the patient is on. All right, so we're coming to the conclusion of this lecture. We've talked about autoimmune hemolytic anemia, what that means in um, blood bank testing. I'm going to post some patient reactions for these warm auto. I want you guys to see what a typical blood bank reaction looks like. So I'm gonna put some IAT results up, some panel reactions up, some eluate reactions. Um, so you guys really see uh, the flow of a blood bank workup for these warm auto patients. There's also a new drug that has recently been um, used for treatment of uh, multi-myeloma patients, and that is daratumab. Um, you might have heard it, it's shortened for Dara. And so what it is, it is a um, IgG antibody, and it um, attaches to the CD38 cell marker on your red cells. So it's an anti-CD38 um, marker. And so what's happening for blood bank testing is that IgG antibody is interfering. Um, so it might even interfere with our ABORH testing. It might interfere, of course, it's gonna cause a positive IAT, a positive panel, um, positive eluate because it is a IgG classification. Um, and so it is proving to be a huge workup for blood bank as well. Um, they are using DTT treatment of the reagent cells um, and DTT is known to remove the CD38 from those cells. And then so the patient's antibody won't react with those cells. So that's one way we're trying to um, identify any underlying antibodies with those patients. So um, I'm gonna post that case scenario in the discussion board of the class as well. Um, so you guys look for that because um, I want you guys, it has some interesting um, findings and I'm gonna post that as well so you guys can see it. All right, I know um, that's probably overwhelming, the process of absorption, understanding warm autoantibodies. Um, mainly what I want you to take from that lecture is warm autoantibodies will cause a positive DAT, it's usually of IgG classification, um, you, your DAT is going to react with polyspecific and monospecific IgG can cause a reaction with complement um, as well um, versus your cold. Your cold, remember they are typically of IgM classification, so your polyspecific will be positive and then your anti-C3B, C3D will be positive. Your monospecific IgG will be negative in a cold reacting antibody. And remember the difference, how you differentiate a cold from a warm. Cold will interfere with all of our initial spin reactions, okay? Um, and then after warming the 37, those, that antibody is usually dissociated, so our reactions are gonna go negative. A warm reacting antibody will react at either 37 and AHG or AHG only. It has to have that 37 degree incubation in order to activate um, allow for the IgG binding of the cells. Okay, that was um, a lengthy lecture. Again, uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. Um, you guys can ask questions now if you'd like. Anybody that's on? Okay, um, so we will end this lecture.